Hello there! Welcome to Skin and Key Productions. I'm Crown Grace Cocon. Let's get into the video. Today's video, we're going to be asking the question of why I left the Conservative Party. Now, it may come as a big shock to some of my supporters that I used to be a Conservative Party member. So we're going to kind of go through a little bit of that. We're going to go through a bit of the context, as we always do. And then we're going to like talk about some wider points, right? So, first of all, my history is kind of confusing, right? It's a little bit complicated. And that's partly because I was raised as a communist, right? Um, so my dad's, you know, he's a communist, he's a you know, Stalinist, you know, and, uh, you know, pro-Castro and all that, right? So growing up, my introduction into politics was kind of along those kind of lines, right? However, around probably the age of maybe 13 or 14, started to look into it a bit more and go, mm, okay, they're responsible for mass murder and also their economic system didn't work because the Soviet Union collapsed in on itself, not because of external pressures, but because of its own like, inefficiencies. And then, you know, even in countries like China, which on paper say that they're communist, the reason why they're doing so well now is because they kind of diverged from that kind of communist ideology and stuff, right? And so they've moved more towards capitalism. So clearly communism wasn't all it was cracked out to be. Although obviously some people still haven't got the message, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. So around the age of maybe 14 into 15, yeah, I was kind of looking around at different ideologies and stuff, yeah, because, uh, yeah, it's a bit like finding out like kind of that, you know, Santa's not real and stuff, yeah. It's a bit like your whole worldview kind of changes and you kind of go, well, well what, what should I believe in now, you know? So you kind of look around at uh, different ideologies and stuff, right? So I did something which at the age of like 14, most people in life never do, which is, you know, think for themselves. And, you know, this is something actually my dad always taught me, you know, it's the, he didn't know it was uh, from uh, Rene Descartes, but it was a thing of, you know, at all times, like question everything, yeah, like even yourself, right? So the fact that I was, was like questioning my beliefs from a young age already kind of set me on a path to have independent thought, right? So around that time, I was reading different, uh, like, you know, philosophical books and political books and stuff. I even was reading uh, Mein Kampf. Uh, so when I've said in, like, previous videos about, uh, you know, you need to have read Mein Kampf in order to understand World War II and, like, the rise of Hitler and what he planned to do in that war. Yeah, that's the time at which I read that book. And luckily, at the same time I was reading that book, I also happened to be reading the books from uh, Thomas Paine, right? So Common Sense, Age of Reason, all these kind of things, right? And Thomas Paine, he was uh, someone who was around during the time of the Enlightenment, right? So he was really instrumental in, like, the formation of, like, what is now pretty much my, my thoughts, right? So not entirely, but had a huge influence, right? Because Thomas Paine was, you know, he was an Englishman, and he went over to America, and he wrote this pamphlet called Common Sense, and this basically advocated for uh, America to become independent and fit to have a Republican kind of government, etc, etc. I'm not necessarily a Republican, but the point is this year, right? What he was arguing for was to this idea of independence, right? So when I talk to people and they kind of go, oh, well, you you know, you're a flip-flopper, you've changed your mind and stuff. It's like, no, when, when it comes down to it, each person has their own core value, right? So for me, my core value is independence, right? I want people to be as independent as possible within the confines of society and stuff. And, you know, so... My worldview is based on that, yeah. The reason I'm interested in politics is because I want people to be independent. I want people to make their own decisions, make their own choices and stuff, yeah. And for the government to basically help them in that, rather than the other way around, where the government is top down and tells people what to do and what to think and stuff, right? So that's kind of a huge influence on my thinking, right? So kind of classical, liberal, kind of like uh, uh, ideology and stuff, right? That's what kind of shaped my views growing up. So by the time I got into sixth form, you know, I was already quite uh, like well versed in a lot of like this stuff. And um, and in particular, around this time, you had uh, Ron Paul, uh, who's running for the Republican uh, Party in America for the 2012 uh, primaries. So I'll do a future video on what if Ron Paul became president. Uh, so, yeah, let me know if you are interested in that. You know, so by the time I got into university in uh, late 2012, I was already you know, a raging kind of like libertarian. And I used to go to different things and I used to debate people and et cetera, et cetera and quite, to quite an annoying level I used to be quite annoying when it came to politics because I had this kind of very much an evangelical kind of view and stuff right uh, and that only changed within the last like few years uh, since becoming a conservative party member actually yeah although around that time I was technically a conservative party member for a brief period yeah although I didn't get involved in anything right but anyway Fast forward now to about 2014, and you had the death of, uh, of someone who was very, very uh, influential for me growing up, yeah, which was Tony Benn, right? So he was a very prominent member of the Labour Party, 
and you know he's a really big influence for like for, for my dad and stuff and, and for me as well you know definitely check Tony Ben out if you like whether you're on the left or the right and stuff yeah he's very 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 uh, like intelligent and very uh, you know he's very much a statesman yeah we need more statesmen in in politics right people who are in politics to make a difference rather than just for for the clout basically you know so he died around that time and it was also at the same time i was looking into like libertarian socialism because libertarianism if you kind of just uh, brought into it yeah you know you're kind of taught oh, okay it's just about free markets and it's, and it's just about like you know policies that basically favor the rich and stuff and it's a little bit more complicated than that because there's different branches of it and there's different like emphasis on it depending on like what kind of outlook you have right so one thing that really influenced me was this idea of workplace democracy right uh, and we'll, we'll talk about this in future videos at some point but like for now just know that like i was interested in, in things like that so i kind of was like okay the Labour party is trying to help poor people and stuff right and I am only interested in politics because I see it as like, well, the only reason government should exist is to help poor people. So maybe if I join the Labour Party and get them to be a little bit more fiscally conservative, you know, so just balance the budget a bit, don't tax people some crazy level, don't spend some crazy amount, you know, maybe if we just hone in on that, maybe we've got like a winning ticket here, right? However, this didn't really work out, right? I mean, I, you know, I managed to get like quite high up in the Labour Party. You know, I ended up becoming a youth officer for my constituency, which sounds much fancier than it actually does. Um, but like, anyway, I, I had that uh, post uh, when I, I came back home uh, from uni. And uh, yeah, so I was kind of on the path to becoming a local councillor. I was on the path to, you know, eventually becoming a local MP because what you have to understand is that, you know, since, since like the uh, Iraq war uh, demonstrations in 2003, when I was nine years old, I've always been like, right, that's it. I want to be prime minister because these kind of things can happen and I want to be, I want to be in the room where it happens, the room where it happens. Anyway, sorry about that. I've been watching too much Hamilton recently. Anyway, <laughs> so with regard to all this, yeah, so I was on like the, the path to eventually, you know, going down the route of eventually end up in parliament and stuff, right? And also as well, it was a thing where, you know, I was liked and respected both by like the left of the party and like by the right of the party as well. And I took part in the um, uh, the leadership election in 2016 um, when I was campaigning for Owen Smith. Uh, although I had voted for Jeremy Corbyn in 2015 and stuff, right? But that's just more because I wanted things to be uh, shifted up and stuff. And I didn't like the other uh, candidates at the time. Um, but, you know, the point is this, yeah, right? You know, so I was involved in that and liked by both sides and stuff, yeah. So... Yeah, I had a winning ticket basically there was no reason why in the long term I couldn't have kind of got to some uh, level of uh, prominence within the Labour Party right and also as well I should have got to say like I was properly like within the Labour Party you know uh, but during like the the uh, uh, the Brexit referendum in 2016 I was working as a cleaner at the time and I actually took a week off of work to campaign for Remain during that time right and then also as well in uh, November of that year I flew out and again took a week off uh, to campaign for, for the Democrats in uh, Virginia in America right uh, I wouldn't have done that now because I don't believe in uh, in interfering in like uh, foreign countries like uh, politics and stuff I think it's for the Americans to decide who they want as president and I wouldn't really like it if Americans flew over to to my country to campaign but either way um but the point is this yeah i was like properly like left wing and stuff and also as well like this is another thing as well um if ever people find anything on the social media and stuff just know that the years in which i was most vocal and the years in which i was most annoying those views that i espoused back then i don't agree with any of those views now like so it's a thing where you know and also as well I was prominent within the Labour Party at that time so if anyone wants to kind of like get any dirt on me just understand that was at a time when I was in the Labour Party and no one said anything about it so if you're gonna cancel me cancel me have fun um but anyway the point is this yeah right so I kind of was on that path however you know, my career wasn't going great because obviously I'd graduated from uni doing politics and was working as a cleaner. So I was like, right, I need to do something to kind of break out of this, right? So I ended up volunteering in Tanzania, East Africa, right? So I did three months there with Riley International. And during that time, you know, first of all, obviously being in, you know, being in England, yeah, like especially being like a leftist within England or just a leftist anywhere in the Western world, people have a very kind of, they have like a very, I don't know how to say, like, in general, they tend to have a view of, oh, our country's not that great, and it's, you know, there's this problem or that problem, it's racist, and blah, 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 blah. And then when you actually go outside of that little bubble, 
and you see the rest of the world and people go oh my god you're from england oh my god like kind of you know like, like, like please please tell me more about your country and stuff right and it was one of those things as well like while i was out there i was reading lots of like history books and reading lots of like politics books and economic books etc because there wasn't much else to do when we weren't working there there was a lot of sitting about yeah it's a bit like war really it's like times when you're working really hard and then the rest of the time you're just sitting about so uh, lots of time to read and you know some of the books i was reading at the time was you know it was like oh well, okay right so it's a little bit more complicated yeah like the reason why some places are rich and some places are poor isn't to do with colonialism and isn't to do with this that, and other exploitation and stuff yeah and similarly the reason why some people are rich and some people are poor isn't really to do with that so Basically, by the time I came back, deep down, I was like, mm, yeah, actually, I don't think I could really be in a late party. However, it's one of those things where when you get that involved in any kind of political party, it's almost like family and stuff. You know, you go to people's houses, you go to people's like dinner parties and stuff. You go, you know, Christmas parties as well. And so, so it's a whole kind of community and stuff. Right. And judging from like how people would respond to just me saying I used to be a conservative party uh, member uh you know some people would just very much distance themselves from you and just not speak to you from that point on so it reminded me a lot of like during the Spanish Inquisition um not that I was there of course but like during the Spanish Inquisition even like Muslims and Jews who had converted to Christianity people were like yeah but are you really Christian though um yeah we can't really trust you so that was kind of the vibe I already got from some people although it was a small minority but the vast vast majority of the people there it was a thing where you know the Labour Party you've got people on the left of the Labour Party and the people on the right of the Labour Party and they disagree on virtually everything and the only thing that they agree on is that they hate the Conservatives right they hate the Tories as we call them in England right and it's a thing where I knew that if I left the party and said I'm a conservative, I would end up losing a lot of that uh, those kind of like friendships and connections and stuff. And yeah, it would kind of yeah. So I kind of end up scuppering my own kind of chances at like p personal advantage. You know, like I'm not gonna give a big pat on my back, like you know. But uh, just yeah, I am giving myself a big pat on the back. Well done for me. Um, but the point is this: it took a long time. So I came back in June of that year, and I waited until like December of that year before I actually left and stuff. I was like, is there anything that's keeping me in this party? And as time went on, it was more like, mm, no. So anyway, I joined the Conservative Party, but I didn't really get involved. Yeah, I didn't want to repeat the same things last time and get involved and whatever. So I joined it, but I kind of stayed on the outside of it and stuff, right? And during this time as well, you had Brexit and all the kind of complications from that. And, you know, so growing up, obviously, you know, being like a communist and stuff, right? It was a thing where, you know, like you're very much in favour of like dismantling the EU and stuff. And, you know, the vast majority of my life, I've been basically a Brexiteer even before the term Brexit was about. So th there was a brief period period like I said like when I was campaigning during uh, the the, uh, the EU referendum and a little bit after that like a few years after that but by like 2019 my views on it had changed because I kind of I looked back at like the previous debates that you had in like the 1975 uh, uh, referendum and stuff and looking at all the kind of arguments they had in like the 70s about Britain joining and then also as well being like hold on why is it that a lot of people from that generation who voted like so overwhelmingly for Remain then, why are they now in overwhelming numbers, you know, like the baby boomers, why are they overwhelmingly voting for leave now? So I looked into all of that and I kind of was like, oh, right, okay, everything that the like, Brexiteers at that point said would happen, end up happening, you know, like the, the, you know, the European Parliament, the European uh, uh, um, uh, uh, single currency and stuff, all these kind of things, yeah, and many other things more than that. People at that time who were in favour of these kind of things said that they wouldn't happen and yet, the Brexiteers would prove right because those things did end up happening. So anyway, so bit by bit and looking into it, I kind of was like, actually, and also as well, when I was supported like being in the EU, I was like, well, Britain will have a dominant place in it, so we'll be more powerful within it and stuff, right? So it wasn't like, you know, it was still from like a national interest kind of like, perspective, right? But over time, I kind of realised, actually, it's not fair, you know, I as an Englishman shouldn't be telling a Frenchman how to live in the same way as Frenchmen shouldn't be telling me how to live. You know, the laws of a country should be made by the people of that country and for the people of that country, right? You know, this is what democracy is, right? you know, a government for, by and of the people, not for, by and of someone in 27 other countries who get a say on what you want. I mean, it's not a, this video is not meant to be a whole big debate on Brexit, so don't get caught in the weeds of that. But around that time, you had Nigel Farage, uh, who uh, you know, was leading uh, the Brexit party, 
And this really shook up like UK politics. Yeah? At one point, the Brexit party was actually leading the polls and the Conservative party was fourth place. So I was kind of like, actually, there's a chance of like actually really shaking up politics and you don't have to be someone from Parliament. Stuff, right? So Nigel Farage, whether you love him or whether you hate him and stuff, yeah, has done more within my lifetime than any other politician, right? So all the 650 MPs in Parliament, this one guy who never got elected, you know, at multiple times lost uh, election every time he tried to like stand for Parliament. This guy's had more impact on uh, UK politics than all these people. So it's not by force I have to like, necessarily go down this road of like uh, going into the major parties and then trying to be a leader then and trying to like, become prime minister that way. No, I don't necessarily. And for me to affect change, because I'm in it to affect change. So even becoming prime minister, OK, it might help, but like it's, I, I can change things without necessarily have to get to that role. But anyway, I've waffled quite a bit now talking about uh, why I left the Labour Party, but I've not really said why I left the Conservative Party. And that's what we'll get on to now. So to answer the question of why I left Conservative Party, very, very simple, I did it for the ladies. No, I'm joking. Um, although I do want to talk on that point, right? Uh, you know, it wasn't to do with that. However, I just need to talk on this point, right? Why is it that people on dating profiles and stuff, yeah, put things, I don't, I don't care what your political views are, why are you putting your political views on a dating profile, right? Uh, uh, your politics, you know, it's important, it's important, but it's not the be-all and end-all of things. And I think this is kind of the problem. I think people focus far too much on politics and make politics such a big part of their life when actually, like, in terms of relationship, day-to-day -day things or relationship is far more than that, right? So I've dated people who have completely different views from me on politics, but it doesn't matter because it shouldn't matter. If your partner is of a different religion than you, then that's a much bigger issue, I think, yeah, than, than, than you know, because, you know, you've got to work out about are they going to church, are they going to a mosque, are they going to synagogue, so what kind of school are they going to, like, how are they going to be uh, brought up and stuff, all these kind of things, right, which are actually far more important than how your parents vote uh, uh, in, in politics, right? It didn't, doesn't matter yet. You could have someone who's Labour and someone who's, 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 who's Conservative and stuff within the same family. The kid will, if anything, will grow up being like, oh, I can think for myself and it's not that big of an issue, right? You know, so when you have people who are like, oh, never kissed a Tory and stuff, right? And, uh, also, there's a song, if you haven't seen it, it's, it's just hilarious, yeah? Like, there's a song called kill Tory scum, right? And the, some of the lyrics of this, right, is like, oh, even if it's your dad or your mum, even if it's your best friend and stuff. I mean, it's just like, and like the reason that the justification that they give for it is like, oh, some people died from austerity and stuff. Yeah, it's, it's like, okay, so a few thousand people died from austerity, but you're advocating for, you know, about 13 to 14 million people vote for the Conservative Party in the last election. So you're advocating for more than double of a Holocaust and somehow you're the you, you somehow you have the moral high ground really we should listen to you yeah i don't think so um and then also as well you know again talk about these pro dating profiles yeah even if i saw someone who was like oh i'm in favor of small government and you know and national sovereignty and etc et i'd be like okay thank you for sharing i don't really need to know that right now i'm kind of more interested in like other things like kind of you know what, what you know what how many kids do you want kids like kind of like what kind of career do you have like kind of what do you like doing on a day out like th these kind of things right th this is the day-to-day -day kind of thing so when you see on dating profiles people being like oh uh, we will get along if we agree on dismantling capitalism or on like uh eating the rich or something whatever kind of nonsense it's like oh my god ah <laughs> like but then also I kind of got tired of like dating girls and stuff, yeah, and then be like, you know what, you're you're the perfect kind of person, you know, like I really, really like to get you. However, the fact that you're a conservative means that I don't think it's going to work out and stuff, yeah, so, you know, we can do other things, but we've got, you know, and it's just like, what? That doesn't make any sense yet. Like, so you're looking for a relationship, you find someone who you would be a perfect person for you in a relationship, but you disagree with their politics, so that's going to, what? That makes no sense. So it wasn't to do with that. It was more the fact of they hated the Conservative Party, but I hated the Conservative Party more. Like, so it's weird. Yeah. So even though they were leftists and stuff, yeah, even though I was a Conservative Party member, I hate the Conservative Party more than they did, right? And all the things that they would be complaining about Conservative Party, I'd be complaining even more. So it's like, so we have agreement. We both hate the Conservative Party, yeah, for different reasons, but we both hate them, right? Yeah. So it's like, so I was like, hold on, right? 
why am I having to defend a party which I don't actually like, right? And I've never actually voted for the Conservative Party. This is the thing as well. In no election have I ever voted for the Conservative Party. Not, not in a local election, not in any kind of nothing, right? And even in the 2019 election where I campaigned for the Conservatives, in the end, I end up looking through different manifestos, yeah? And I was like, actually, the Brexit Party, yeah, the Nigel Farage's Brexit Party, yeah, which is now the Reform Party UK, their manifesto, to me, like, it speaks more to me and stuff, yeah. It's more, like, libertarian and stuff. And, you know, the only thing I didn't like about it was, like, the, the, the 50,000 uh, 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 migrants a year, like, you know, like, for net migration, yeah. Because immigration, for me, isn't even, like, top, like, 10 issues, right? Um, although, I will say, like, if you're voting for the Conservative Party, so for every single year, they've, they've had a thing where it's like, right, okay, we, we want net migration to be 100,000. First of all, how do you determine net migration? You can't control the number of people going out each year uh, and the number of people coming in, it will fluctuate and stuff, right? And also as well, in terms of like net migration, having a hard cap like that doesn't make any sense because if you have a million like doctors, yeah, or mi a million like Elon Musk or whatever, yeah, right, trying to come into the country, are you going to be like, no, nah, sorry, like, no can do, sir. Like uh, we, we've hit our, 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 our maximum, right? doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So I don't really agree on that. However, I do agree that the British public have never been given the say on that, right? No one's ever voted for 200,000, 300,000, a third of a million net migration figures every single year. Uh, obviously, it's fluctuated year by year and stuff, yeah, but it's been more than 100,000, right? And it has been every year since 1997 when Tony Blair changed the rules on it, right? So it's a thing where people have never been given the say on it, right? And I'm in favour of di direct democracy, so people having, like, more say with regard to, like, referendum and stuff, right? And not just for that issue, but for a whole myriad of issues. So people want to raise the tax rate, if people want to lower the tax rate, et cetera, et cetera, it should be the people who have a, a say on that, yeah? Not just the MPs. So I've spoken about a lot of these different things, right? But this is the reason why I end up leaving the Conservative Party, right? First of all, they're not fiscally conservative. So this is something I have to really explain to people, right? In terms of fiscal conservatism, it's supposed to be in favour of responsibility, right? It's supposed to be in favour of, right, so we've taxed this much and we're spending this much and we're not going to spend more than what we raise through tax revenue, right? However, the Conservative Party has not done that, right? We are in the middle of a debt crisis and this is the first time in our history we've been in a debt crisis, not because of war. You know, the last time we were in this level of debt was back in, like, 1960, right? And that was because we were coming back from, like, World War II in 1945. And so, like, the debt levels were incredibly, incredibly high because we were obviously paying that back. And paying it down every single year. Da, 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 da. And, you know, so you can see on the, on the graph here, it's, it's going down, it's going down, it's going down. So in 2002... Our debt to GDP ratio, right, was just 27%. So just 27% of GDP was public debt, right? By the time it got to 2010, it risen to 64%, right? So you could go, oh, okay, cool, there was the recession, et cetera, et cetera, in like 2007, 2008. So it rose then, okay, fine. So that's 64%, right? In 2019, so bear in mind, this is before Corona, right? And this is years of so-called austerity, right? This is nine years of so-called austerity when the Conservative government have been in power and they've been like, right, we're, we're clamping down on this, right? The debt figures rose to 82%, right? It rose to 82%. And then now that we have corona, right, it's now risen to 104%, right? Uh, so this is the largest level of uh, debt that we've had since 1960. And we don't really have anything to show for it, right? So even before COVID we had nothing to show for this, right? And now we're just getting into even more debt. What for, right? And it's supposed to be the party of fiscal responsibility. And no government in this country has balanced the budget since 2001. Okay, there was one year in like, 2019 where we just about, just about like, kind of got over the line, right? But you've had years and years of excessive government spending at a time of relative peace. Yes, you had the war on terror and stuff, but it wasn't exactly World War Two, you know, like uh, our defence spending didn't suddenly like rapidly uh, expand, yeah, like to the levels we saw in World War One and World War Two. In, in real terms, it was a, a small war, right? And most of the spending was done because of social programmes, right? So it wasn't really to do with our war there at all. So this was completely avoidable. And the Conservative Party have now been in power for 11 years. And what have they done about it? Nothing. On top of that, government spending is the highest it's been since 1947, and taxation is the highest it's been since the mid-80s, right? So 1993, the year of my birth, the amount of tax that we had as a percentage of GDP was about 31.5%, right? 
Now it's at 37.5%. And it went from 35.5 to 37.5% during this time, right? So from 2010 to, uh, to the present day, right? It's gone up under the Conservative Party, right? And this is, you know, you can say COVID, et cetera, et cetera, but it's gone up anyway. And government spending since the year 2000, yeah, has gone up from 31% to now 52%, right? So over half of all the economy, right? So half of all the money being spent in that year, right? Is going to the government, right? And also as well, we have a highly centralized uh, government within this country in which 80% of it is spent from central government. So local government makes up 20% of it. The central government, you know, Westminster makes up 80% of that. So almost 40% of the entire economy is being spent from Westminster. And then you wonder why London ends up being, you know, you know taking up a huge, huge percentage of like the, the, uh, the UK's uh, population and of its GDP and stuff, yeah? It's because all the power and all the money is being drained from the rest of the country into London it's going to civil servants, going to politicians, etc., etc. This is the situation we have at the moment. And it's been happening more and more so under a Conservative government. And what about the so-called austerity? Well, okay, right. So in 2005, we're looking at a health spending now. It went from 6% of GDP. Then it went up to 7.5% in 2010, right? So the Labour Party within those five years, right, raised it from 6% to 7.5, right? The Conservative Party by 2019 had reduced it from 7.5 to 7. So not even going back to the levels it was before 2005, right? It's not even going back to the times you know, during like, uh, the Labour government stuff, right? It reduced it from 7.5 to 7. Now, under COVID, it's now shot up to 10.44%, right? So you'd be like, okay, right, it's because of COVID, et cetera, et cetera. But still, even before then, it still was ridiculously high levels of, uh, of healthcare spending, right? So this is a time of so-called austerity. And what about national insurance, right? So national insurance is pretty much the reason why I ended up doing this video, yeah, because it really, really annoyed me when the Conservatives uh, recently raised this, right? So as a percentage of GDP, in 2010, it was 6.2%. In 2021, it's 6.9%, right? So it's gone up under the Conservative Party, but this before they raised it recently, right? And on top of that, yeah, when you look at uh, national insurance, it disproportionately affects working people and middle-class people, right? Far more so than it does the rich. So if you're someone who earns 50,000 pounds a year, right? This before the recent changes, right? You paid roughly about 5,000 pounds a year in national insurance. If you're someone earning a quarter of a million, so five times as much, you only paid £9,000 a year, right? You know, you could be earning almost five times more and not even be paying twice as much, right? This shows how broken national insurance is because people often think, oh, it's just putting money in to, you know, to, to help like, like grandma out in like the, the nursing home and it's like, doing this and it's doing that. No, it's just another tax which has been spent, right? And it's coming from your pockets and it's going to just be wasted by the government, right? Obviously, the government does some good things, but it's incredibly, incredibly inefficient, right? I could talk about that at endless lengths of how inefficient it is this is not the video for that right but the point is this right even before this it was a you know disproportionate tax which affected working class and middle class people and barely touched the rich at all right and now it's been raised even more so right so i've not even looked at the figures for it now but you guys can look at it yourself yeah and and tell me whether this is a system which makes any level of sense on top of that vat has also gone up as well so VAT under the Conservative government, yeah, from 2010 was at, you know, it was at 6.9%. By 2020, it had risen to 8.2%, right? So there's not to do with the, the crisis, et cetera, et cetera. It's to do with them putting the tax burden more and more on working class and poor people, right? And this is the thing. The Conservative Party doesn't care about poor people, right? Now, the Labour Party also doesn't care about them as well. They should change their name like that. You know, maybe they should just merge with like the Lib Dems and form like the Democrat Party, whatever. But considering the fact that most working class people now vote for the, the, the Conservative Party and most uh, upper and middle class people now tend to vote for the Labour Party, maybe they should change the name on that. But I'm talking now to, you know, working class uh, Tory voters and stuff here. Look at this. It doesn't make any sense yet. Why are you still voting for this party, right? If you're a fiscal conservative, you should not be voting for the Conservative Party because what have they done in the last 11 years they've been in government, which is fiscally conservative? Tell me, please tell me, what, what have they done, which is fiscally conservative, yeah? What what have they done to lower taxes? What have they done, you know, even if, even if, you're, even if you're rich and stuff, right? They raised it from 40% to 45%, right? 
So, wh 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 you know, wh where's, where's the fiscal conservatism at all? It doesn't exist, right? And this is another thing as well, right? So, me being a conservative, why would you vote for a conservative party if you want to reform things, right? So, the Brexit party changed itself to Reform UK, and I want to reform things, right? So, there's lots of things I like with this system. However, there's lots of things I don't like about the system, right? And as George Dawson said, you know, reform delayed is revolution begun. And that's the mantra that I've kind of like lived by in recent years, yeah, right? So... There's so many things, there's so many constitutional reforms which need to be done. There's so many legislative reforms that need to be done. For instance, why do we still have an uh, unelected House of Lords, right? Why do we still have a first-past-the-post system, right? Why do we have all these different things? Like, it, the, the system is broken. There's, there's, I could go on for endless, endless amount of time about this year. And why do we still not have a written constitution, right? It, or we do, but it's, it's all over the place, right? Why do we not have a codified constitution? Actually, this is something which, in my own spare time, after, because I've recently I've been like reading the Federalist Papers and I've been reading the Anti-Federalist Papers and looking into the framing of like, the, the US Constitution and all the kind of debates that surrounding that and stuff, right? And you go, okay, right, this, you know, what came out of this, whether you agree with some parts or disagree, there was some level of debate that went into this. Whereas we just have a system which kind of goes, eh, we'll just add this on and just add that on. And oh yeah, there's that, that thing there that contradicts that. And no one knows, in the time of crisis, like when we had Brexit, nobody knew where the buck like uh, landed yet. No one knew like, kind of what should be done right who has more uh, like preeminence like like, like there's no who has checks and balances there was there was nothing right it was complete chaos it was complete shambles and that's why i've actually started drafting an english constitution right uh so that obviously won't be out for many many years although i do have a draft of it if people be interested in having that conversation right you know so i want to conserve certain parts of the country right so you know the fact obviously you know as, as i've said in previous videos yeah you know we are the, the you know the land of hope and glory mother of the free right you know our anglo-saxon heritage you know this is where we get the idea of limited government from this is where we get the idea of individual liberty from so i'm all in favor of preserving that and conserving that right but i want to reform things i don't just want to keep things the way they are and the way things are are not like right <laughs> we have basically a socialized like system right where the government is a huge huge but even before this crisis government played far too big of a role and so i don't really want to conserve that i want to change that way right? i don't want to get rid of the government completely you know there's obviously like a need for government but i want it to be drastically reduced in the size and scope of what it is currently so i don't want to conserve that i want to reform that and so here's my message to conservative party voters right okay if you are of like, like you know the top five percent of the of the country right if you're part of like the kind of like bullying din boy kind of like you know if you're you know if you went to boarding school if you're you know very very rich etc etc you know you, your father owns a business and blah 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 I get it. I'm not going to tell you, you know, so for me, I vote for politics, not because of what's in my self-interest, because for me, regardless of who gets into government, doesn't really affect my day-to-day -day life. It's not really, you know, there might be some slight inconveniences and some slight benefits, but my life's not really affected by who ends up, you know, and most people's lives are not really that affected. There's only a handful of people who are significantly affected by any kind of government policies, yeah, especially within a liberal democracy when policy is not too extreme. So, I've always been interested in politics for the nation's interest and I don't really do it because it's like, oh, well, this will help me and stuff, right? But some people vote along those kind of lines, right? So if you are someone from like the, you know, the, the upper echelons of society and stuff, right, and you kind of want to preserve the system as it currently is, calm, good luck to you, vote for the Conservative Party. But if you're middle class or if you're working class or if you're, you know, why are you voting for the Conservative Party? Especially if you're a Brexiteer. You voted to leave the EU, leave the Conservative Party, right? The Reform Party, you know, formerly the Brexit Party, that is the party which better represents you, right? And actually, even a majority of Conservative Party members would be happy with Nigel Farage being the leader of the Conservative Party, right? So the Reform Party is kind of where you guys are at anyway, right? So why not just vote for what, what, what is in your heart? And I get it, obviously, a lot of people tactically vote and stuff, yeah? And people, I've even spoken to some people, yeah, who go, you know what, I agree with what you're saying, 100% agree with what you're saying, but I really hate Labour, and I really don't want to see Labour back in. Okay, that doesn't make any sense, right? So, like, so you're picking the lesser of two evils, why not just go with what you actually want? And then, if everyone did that, then the Reform Party would be the replacement of the Conservative Party, yeah, and then that would be the dominant kind of party on the so-called right, right? So... Also, I just want to say this point. What is the point in voting for the, the Conservative Party, right? As I've already laid out, it's pretty much 
blue Labour, right? There's no real point. There's no like you know whether you're voting for the Labour Party or whether you're voting for uh, for for like the the Conservative Party, it doesn't make any difference, right? These people are just Blairites and blue, right? They don't actually really care about you, and they are doing things in their own interest and stuff, right? And they're not representing your interest, not representing conservative values. So why would you continue to vote for a party which doesn't actually believe in conservatism? It doesn't make any sense, does it? No, exactly. So stop doing it, right? The definition of insanity is keep doing the same thing and expecting different results. Stop voting for a party which claims to be conservative but doesn't actually do anything, right? So, you know, why would you continue to do that? Vote for your heart, vote for your mind, vote for your soul, vote for a party which represents you, right? And, you know, even if you can't bring yourself to a vote for a reform party, vote for literally anyone, even vote for Labour, right? If you, if you, if it's, you know, and this is what I would say, right? I would rather have 10 years of Labour government than have one more year of this fake Conservative government. That's how serious I am about this year, because what is the difference, right? You're having huge levels of debt, you're having huge levels of spending, you're having huge levels of taxation, you may as well just vote for the Labour Party. What is the point in voting for a Conservative Party which does all those things anyway? You see what I'm saying? So that's basically my stance on that. And also just the final thing, the final cherry on the top, right? The top 10 Tory donors, right? These are 10 individuals, they make up about a quarter of all of the Conservative Party donations, right? You know, and then if you scaled it down to like how many people make up 50% and you know, et cetera, et cetera, the Conservative Party doesn't care about you people, right? It doesn't listen to your interests, right? Who are they gonna listen to? You, you know, Joe Blog down the street or are they gonna listen to like these 10 top donors? Yeah, they're gonna listen to the top 100 donors, right? You know, these are millionaires and billionaires and stuff, right? They don't represent your interests, right? And if you wanna continue to vote for them, that's fine, but just understand that, you know, when you vote for them and then they don't do what you told them to vote for, yeah? Don't be surprised because this is the, the logical conclusion of it. We have a broken politics in this country. We have a broken system. And if you continue to contribute to this, yeah, don't be surprised when we end up having a broken system, right? If you stop contributing to it, the system will get better. And so, all that being said, uh, don't forget to hit the like button uh, if you like this video and also share it with your friends as well, sharing is caring and also as well we have merchandise so definitely check out uh, our merchandise as well. Hit us up on Instagram if you're interested in any and uh, the next video I'm going to give a choice actually, yeah. so I'm going to give a choice between three different ones. One is the to do with uh, what if Ron Paul became president in 2020, um, in 2012. Uh, the, the second is going to be on uh, the, you know, the Afghanistan one, like what if Afghanistan had peace, which is what I said last time. And the third one is going to be on what if Britain lost the Falklands War, right? So you have a choice now, you're sport for choice, you've got three choices. So let me know uh, what you, which one uh, you'd want to do. And um, yeah, in the meantime, have a great day and bye.